Um, last week we were in Second Kings, the 16th chapter. Seems like I'm losing my voice, but hopefully you all can hear me fairly well. So tonight um, we're going to be looking at Second Chronicles, the 28th chapter. But I will be bouncing back and forth to Second Kings, the 16th chapter, and Second Chronicles, the 28th chapter. Um, I'm wanting to complete all of Second Chronicles, the 28th chapter. There are 27 verses there. On um, last week, if you were with with us, I said that I would um, possibly do that. So anyway, I can talk about some of that once we get started. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go ahead and look at the scriptures. We come before you again tonight, I'm grateful for this day. I'm asking that. Um, when we come together, that we understand the seriousness and the joy that we should have from looking at your word, the seriousness, because it's dealing with issues of life. May we not neglect the study of your word, the hiding of your word in our hearts and the obedience to your word. Please open our eyes to see you through your word and the patterns of man in your pattern. I ask that you will just um, continue to protect us in your grace and mercy, but also help us to mature so that we can uh, live lives that are pleasing to you. We need help. We need your strength. We need your spirit while living at home, on the jobs, while we are going to and fro, either running errands or what have you. Please help us with our children. And uh, we thank you for, for, for Jesus and his sacrifice. May he be sovereign in our lives. I ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. The title I'm going to give my lesson tonight is God will leave you to your own limited satisfaction. I repeat it. It's, a, it's, it's sort of long. God will leave you to your own limited satisfaction. Um, as you, if you've been with us from time to time, you know I like to give a summary. Lately, I've said for probably about the past three weeks or so, or month, I'm going to try to give a brief summary. I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be brief tonight because I think what these two chapters bring, first of all, I think it's somewhat puzzling in with regards to when did one thing happen before or after another. So I'm going to pause it. I'm going to give you what I think, but it's not totally conclusive. I've, anyway, so I'm going to I'm going to share that with you. So the synopsis, because I focused in the 16th chapter of Second uh, Kings last week, so I will give a little synopsis with that. But then I'm going to um, bring in uh, more information, which I'm sure some of you have read, but others it might have been a while. And so we hope to do that tonight. God will leave you to your own limited satisfaction. We've been looking at, as you know, in the Kings, and we've been focusing primarily as of late with the uh, king of Judah. This is Ahaz. Ahaz was a wicked, ungodly king, wicked, ungodly king. So I'm going to refer to verses. And if you look in uh, Second Kings, the 16th chapter, let's say about the first seven verses, we're going to see why. I'm going to allude to some of that, but in a second. Ahaz, he was so wicked. Um, we see that God allows two, how uh, can I say, enemy nations to come against him. Uh, the scripture would talk about how God would allow Rezin, who was the king of Syria, that's northward, as well as Pekah, king of Israel, that's also northward, to come against Judah because of the things that Ahaz had done. And say, well, who was Ahaz? It's Jotham's son. It's Jotham's son. Okay. Um, let's let's continue on talking about it. Second Kings, the fifteenth chapter, and the thirty seventh verse, is the scripture you might want to refer to. You say, Gary, you mean God sent them? If you read that verse, what we see is God's permissive will, in keeping with what He had said about letting other nations come in when the people that He had chosen. For unto himself 
when they would continue to go against God, he said, these are the things, my judgment, my glittering sword, uh, 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 I'm going to I'm going to try to draw you back in line by letting you know you are doing wickedly and you're doing this against me who I'm the one that's provided so much for you. And you've thrown me and my laws and my desires behind your back. So. Second Kings 15 and 37, that's where you see that. So let's continue on with our uh, summary from where we were on last week. Resident Pekka, the Pekka, however you want to pronounce it, they conspire, they form an alliance to go against the king of Judah. Now, uh, in looking at 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 1 through 6, what are some of the things that we see there? This is also reiterated or mentioned again in 2 Chronicles 28, okay? First few verses, about the first four or five verses. Ahaz offered his son to uh through the he burned his son as a sacrifice unto let's say uh heathen gods the de- demonic spirits if you will should have never happened should have never happened he also would continue to worship uh, uh in the high place and even set up idols let's just go back briefly for uh a minute or two and let's look at what this is saying here I want to read just a few verses. Listen at what it says in verse 3 of uh, the 16th chapter of 2 Kings. It says, you, do you have a dream? Read it, please. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen, whom Yahweh cast out from before the children of Israel. Read the fourth verse. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places, and on the hills, and under every green tree. So we see that he's very wicked. I talked about, you know, this a little bit on last week. So you can go back if you want to and either read or listen to the podcast when it's posted. So there's there's this problem of his wickedness. Now, if you remember also where we were on last week, you'll also see that Ahaz sent messengers to the king of tiglath Pileser in Assyria, that would be going eastward. So in that particular account of what happened in history, there are some things that we don't get to see, that if you go to the 28th chapter of Second Chronicles, we get to see some of this. Let's look and see what's going on here. Resident Pekka, according to the 16th chapter, Second King, uh, I try not to confuse you because when I was looking at this, I was thinking this can be confusing. So I'm going to I'm going to say it as, as Pastor Tim says, this might cause a little work for some of us. OK. It, it looks like there's almost a contradiction in one uh, in, in Kings versus the Chronicles. If we look at the fifth verse of uh, Second Kings, the uh, 16th chapter, I'm going to read it. And Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. So these two kings who formed an alliance allowed by God to go against the king of Judah, the Bible says they couldn't overcome him. However, if we look at the, I want to say it's the um, the fifth verse also in the 28th chapter of Second Chronicles, Let's read how this one uh, sounds. Tree, if you if you have it, it's Chronicles twenty eight and wherefore, five. Wherefore Yahweh his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him, and carried away a great multitude of them captives, and brought them to Damascus, and he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. Okay. So when you're looking at the both both of the verses are talking about Ahaz, and so it, it can be a little puzzling. So let's try and, and, and make some some sense of that. And we're going to continue a little with our summary and move on into further scriptures here. When we're looking in, in Second Kings, we see that the uh the kings of the north were able to capture uh or Syria were able to capture capture the city that was uh named Aloth. Aloth would be if you're interested in, in 
the geography. Edom is, let's say, um, it's, it's southernmost, right? Like if you look at all of the, the cities of Judah, when you come down, you're going to see Edom. We're going even further south of Edom. Alaf is a city that's on a, it's like by a sea, so it's a seaport. Um, they were able to capture that city because when when Syria and Israel were trying to capture Jerusalem, the walls were so great and so fortified that they were unable to penetrate through. So in that sense, they were unable to capture Ahaz. But they but they were able to pillage and gain control of Eloth and, and do some other things, which we'll read about in the account in Chronicles. Let me repeat it again. They weren't able to totally just take Ahaz captive. Does that make sense? Because of the walls. So when we're looking in Chronicles, uh, the 28th chapter, and we look at the fifth verse, I'm going to go back to this Chronicles. I'm going to read the fourth verse and the fifth verse because it'll seem to contradict, but it doesn't. Listen, this is talking about Ahaz. I'm in Chronicles, Second Chronicles 28 and 4. Ahaz sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. Now Damascus, Damascus is what you might call the capital or the headquarters of Syria. He was also delivered, uh, brought to, uh, where, okay. If you see it, Drew, you can just take it over. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with great slaughter. Now, sometimes if you're reading the King James Version, smote or to be smitten sounds like a person is dead, but it also can mean conquered. So what we need to do is think of, oh, am I talking too fast? Oh, my wife said beat down. You can also think of the cities and the the, uh, the regions of people that were under him. So remember, uh, Elahoth was taken, and we see that some captives have been taken also, which was was not met, mentioned in Second uh, Kings 16 chapter. So we can look at that as understanding that he was basically defeated. All right, we're getting closer to really where I'm, I'm wanting to be now. Now. On last week, let me slow down a little bit. So sometimes when I'm doing the the summary, I'm like, I, I don't want to take so much time that I feel like I'm rushing with the other part. So I might have been rushing. Pardon. Um, last week in Second Kings, we see where uh, Ahaz requested assistance from the king of Assyria. And if you remember when we went on down, we saw that Ahaz was so impressed by an altar that the Assyrian king Tiglath Pileser had that he had uh, it copied, I, I would imagine, dimensions and so forth. And he had enough information sent to uh, Uriah the priest that he had an altar erected in the temple of God, which was not there before. In other words, he replaced what God had allowed Solomon to do in all his grandeur. He replaced it. We're going to see a little bit more on that this evening, the things that Ahaz did. So it becomes, at least when I was looking at it and looking at it and looking at it, I said, okay, so when did one thing happen before another? When did he actually ask for help? Well, we're going to come back to that. Let's turn now to Second Chronicles, the 28th chapter. Okay. We're going to pick up at the sixth verse. We're picking up at the sixth verse because the first five verses, it's, it somewhat repeats what we've seen in the Kings. It repeats the fact that he was wicked. It repeats the fact that sun was burned through the fire and that he, he worshiped in the high places and that he was wicked. Okay. Um, now, as we get ready to go through this, we're going to see some other things that took place that we didn't see in chapter um, 16 and 2 Kings. Drew, if you would, I would like for you to read from 2 Chronicles, the 28th chapter, 6 through the 15th verse. Do understand that this still may be a little like, okay, okay, but I'm hoping I can explain this where we're getting uh, enough continuity that we can see that this man was still wicked. Let's continue uh, on with um, chapter 28. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah a hundred and twenty thousand in one day. 
all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Maasia, the king's son, and Azrakam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah, that was next to the king. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them, and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of Yahweh was there, whose name was Oded, and he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because Yahweh God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he has delivered them into your hand, and you have slain them in a rage that reaches up unto heaven. And now you purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. But are there not with you even with you sins against Yahweh your God. Now hear me therefore and deliver the captives again, which you have taken captive of your brethren. For the fierce wrath of Yahweh is upon you. Let's stop right there, because this this will be a lot of reading, and I don't want I don't want us to forget what you've read in light of what I'm trying to help us to understand. Okay. So bear with me, bear with me, saints. Okay. So on last week when we were in Second Kings we saw that uh, Ahaz asked help from Tiglath Pileser. What we're reading right here, I believe when we look at the scriptures, this was happening before he asked for help from Tiglath Pileser. I can't totally certify you that because what happens is, remember, battles and wars can happen a long time. So I can't tell you definitely for sure. But even in this text tonight, we're going to see in verse 16 that it kind of refers to it. What's happening here? Since Rezin and Pekah, the two kings who've joined against Ahaz, they've come against him. They were unable to capture him in Judah because of the walls. So they continue on doing other things. When they're unable to totally take captive, if you will, Ahaz, um, they're successful at taking captive some of the people of Judah. Let's go back to the sixth verse and kind of go through some of this. Oh, but before I do, I also want to mention something else that we talked about last week. We looked at a few verses in Isaiah. <laughs> we looked at a few verses in Isaiah, the seventh chapter. Isaiah being a man of God, he went to Ahaz and in, 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 in God's mercy, he went to Ahaz. He says, Ahaz, you need to ask God a sign. It's like, Ahaz, even though you have been wicked, even though you've done all these things, you need to turn to God. You need to be obedient to God's word. Ask a sign. And we saw that Ahaz was wicked. And he said, I will not. And we tried to show how that tied up to what this account is that we're looking at tonight and what we saw in uh, 2 Kings, the 16th chapter. So he chose not to listen to the prophet of God. So what's happening? This is around the time I believe that Isaiah had gone. This is around the time that uh, uh, after they were unable to totally overthrow Judah, this Syrian king, this Assyrian king, uh, uh, king of Israel, rather, they're um, they're doing some things. Go I'm going back to verse six. Now, listen, for Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah and 120,000 men in one day, which were all valiant men. Pekah is Israel. This is his brother. Why is this happening? Because Ahaz had forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. Now, my title is, if you can um, mute this, Jesus, it would be wonderful. If you remember my title, said, God will leave you to your own limited satisfaction. After uh, Isaiah, or somewhere around the time that Isaiah came to him, he rejected it because he had chose something else. He chose something else over God. And so God said, OK, this is how you're going to be. Your people are going to suffer. Your kingdom are gonna, is going to suffer and you're going to suffer. Listen at it. Because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. Listen at verse seven. And Zik Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Messiah, the king's son. Ahaz, one of his sons. He loses his life because his father chooses not to adhere or obey the word of God. And a Zikram, the governor of the house, there would be uh, men 
who would help uh, take care of the business in the king's house and, 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 and administratively and so forth. He loses his life. And Elkanah, that was next to the king. Now, when you read that, it almost sounds like he might be what you would call a prime minister. One of the uh, texts that I was looking at said they believe that this guy was a, a general or something over the army. There's three persons mentioned here who lose their life. Can I say and unnecessarily? Is that the right way to say it? Unnecessarily, Ahaz. You only care about yourself. You didn't care about your son. You didn't care about the people of God. At least David in his wicked, he re wickedness, he repented. But he cared about the people of God. Lord have mercy. Listen at this. I'm at verse 8 now in Second Chronicles 28. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. Now, this is saying... Those who were related to the people of God, remember the split kingdom in Israel, they took these people away. No care, no regard. Let's call it chaos. Let's call it wickedness. Let's call it sin. Let's call it, let's call it God letting you have your own way. Ahaz. So in light of what we have looked at, imagine this going on. And so Ahaz says, I got to have some help. J j the, the wall's not broken through, but there's people outside the wall getting killed. There's this 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 things happening. So he seeks help from Tiglath Pileser. Now, there's another prophet in the text tonight. Last week in Second uh, Kings 16, we went to Isaiah to see a little, little bit more of the story. This is a prophet that is in Israel, and he's going to go to the let's say some of the leaders in Israel and say, God's not pleased with what you did. You did a little too much. We've seen that in the scripture, haven't we? I think we see, I think it's Isaiah, the 10th chapter, somewhere around the 13th verse, but we're not going to go there tonight. But I just want us to know there's there's instances in the scripture where God will be like, mm, I didn't give you permission to do all that. What do these verses say right here? This prophet, his name is Oded. I want you to pick back up at this ninth verse and read back down to the 11th verse, if you will. But a prophet of Yahweh was there whose name was Oded, and he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because Yahweh God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he has delivered them into your hand, and you have slain them in a rage that reaches up unto heaven. And now you purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. But are there not with you, even with you, sins against Yahweh, your God? Read 11. Now hear me, therefore, and deliver the captives of, again, which you have taken captive of your brethren. For the fierce wrath of Yahweh is upon you. Okay. Oded goes to the people eh, who God has allowed to uh, take captive, the people of Judah. The, the the people who are under Ahaz. Odette goes to them and he, he rebukes them. And he says, wait a second, you men, you soldiers, you leaders of Israel. What meaneth this? I'm going back to the verse, you know I am. Listen at it. And a, but a prophet of, I'm at the ninth verse, but a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Odette and he went out before the host that came to Samaria. And I was reading in Josephus and Josephus says he, uh, he went out uh, beyond their wall. So imagine they've taken captives. And one of the things that you would see culturally when a nation would be captured, they would strip the people down naked and mark, um, cause them, cause them to walk in sort of like single file. And, and they would, they would, they would um, pretty much take the belongings, the spoil, the, the booty, and they would go back in this victorious uh, march, if you will, so that the people at their hometown where they're returning with all of this spoil and these new slaves and these captive people, they can say, oh, oh victorious, victorious. Oh, dead, the way uh, it's written in, in Josephus's account. It's like he meets them before they get through the, through, uh, the wall uh, up in, uh, up in, um, up in uh, Israel. And it rebukes him. Listen, bec listen oh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back here. He come out to Samaria and he said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand. In other words, he, Oded is like, look, you Israelites, 
don't be so pompous. It is God who's delivered these people from Judah into your hands. Now, when I was reading this, I was like, if the prophet rebuked them, did they have prior knowledge as to how far they should go with their destruction, their captivity, and so forth? I can't prove it, but that's what I'm believing. Odette tells them, you slew them in a rage that reaches up to heaven. It's like you went over, overboard. Who told you to punish like this? Now, if we recall anything that we've been looking at in the scriptures, other time we've learned about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and so forth. When you see what sins of, let's say, from one person to another, a neighbor to another person. So it looks like God has a certain balance. You don't go overboard. So we can at least take that precept, and it seems that it applies here. He's rebuking them, and it seems like there's a knowledge that they should have had. Listen, 10th verse. Odette is still talking to the, the, the men of Israel. And now you purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondage and bond women unto you. But are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? In other words, it's like you can add to the fact that you're sinful. You can add to the fact that God knows how you've been living. You can add to the fact, is this what you want? You you about to do something very egregious. God was wroth with them. Do you want his anger to come upon you? It makes me think of Romans 2, somewhere around verses 5 or 6. So Odette says it in verse 11. Now hear me therefore and deliver these captives again. In other words, let them go. You're not going to bring them up here and make them slaves. Let them go. Listen to how it reads. I'm at verse 11. Now hear me therefore and deliver the captives again, uh, which ye have taken captive unto your brethren with uh for the fifth wrath, <laughs> the fierce wrath thank you. Is upon. God's wrath is on you. Now, there's something that I think we need to see in the scriptures. These prophets come and they rebuke. And sometimes they come and they say it's too late. And sometimes they come when it's like, it's almost like this is your last opportunity before God breaks, breaks forth upon you. It's like he, they they have the option right here. They have the ability. They have the knowledge. They have the, I'm, I'm going to say the grace of God teaching them that you need to reject. You need to deny what it is, what's inside your heart to go beyond what God has prescribed to you. It's like, don't do it. But if you do now, why am I saying this? Because I'm just thinking about the other prophet that we talked about on last week, Isaiah, who went to Ahaz and Ahaz would none of his counsel. Ahaz threw the counsel of Isaiah, God's word behind his back. Now, if you can remember before I started with tonight's lesson, I said Second Kings of 15. Don't try not to get lost. I know some lessons I'm like, oh, Lord, how do I bring this forth? Second Kings of 15, chapter in the 37th verse says, God sent Rezin and Pekah. Right? Okay. God still sent. <laughs> God still sends people. <laughs> God still sends his, 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 his women servants to help those within the body of Christ, and sometimes those without. But the Bible says nobody's going to be with an excuse anyway. So let's go on to this. So I'm going to pick back up. These men in Israel now have been warned. Dream, if you would, I want you to read from the 12th verse through the 16th verse, because the 16th verse takes us back to where we saw it in 2 Kings 16. So read from verses 12 through 16 in 2 Chronicles 28, please. Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Johanna, Berechiah, the son of Mishalama, and, Jehez, and Jehizkiah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Hadlai, stood up against them that came from the war, and said unto them, You shall not bring in the captives hither, for whereas we have offended against Yahweh already, you intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass. For our trespass, our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. 
So the armed men left, the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. And the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives and with the spoil clothed all that were naked upon them, among them, and arrayed them and shod them and gave them to eat and to drink and anointed them and carried all the feeble of them upon asses and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. At that time, did King Ahab sing unto, send unto the kings of Assyria to help him? Okay, let's talk about this. We see that there's some repetition. We're, I've gone into the lesson more now, but I'm, I'm still actually in the summary from last week, okay? Because we're looking at filler. What's going on? These men of, of Israel hear what Oded is saying to them. They take wise counsel. Did you hear me? They take wise counsel. It might not have felt good. Could you imagine how, how they felt victorious and all that? Let's go back to where we are. The 12th verse is giving us some hard, <laughs> some hard names to pronounce up there. But these would be based on what I've read and different translations that I've looked at. These are some, some key leading figures or men uh, in Israel. Listen at what it says. I'm back at the 12th verse in Second Chronicles 28. Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim. Ephraim sometimes is used uh, to refer to Israel. If you were to look at Israel geographically, um, I think Dan, I want to say Dan was up in the north. Um, anyway, so let's say Dan was up in the north. As you go to the southernmost point of what is considered Israel, those tribes you see Ephraim um that that tribe and I want to say Benjamin before you get into Judah so it's sort of the southern the southern portion of the 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 northernmost kingdom I hope that makes sense okay so listen again then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim Azariah the son of Jeho Johanan Berechiah the son of Mishlamoth and Jehis Jehiskiah the son of Shalom and Amasa the son of Hadlai uh, stood up against them and came from the war. Okay, what are these men saying? Okay, even if I mispronounce them, we know that there's about, I think there's four men mentioned here, Dre. If I'm wrong, you can tell me. I believe there's four, uh, four or five men, four men, I think, mentioned here. What do they say? These men are going to say something to the soldiers who brought back the people walking in a procession from Judah. Remember, they're naked because they're they're taken captive. Now, sometimes when the Bible says naked, in some cases, you might still have a person with an armor, uh, not an armor, an undergarment that's on. So I don't know how full they were. It could be that they were, but not in all cases when you'll see that in, in scriptures. I'm not talking about Genesis, okay? I'm not talking about Genesis. Here we are, 13. What did these men say? And they said unto them, you shall not bring the captives hither. They're repeating. Listen. They have, you know, you go to these seminars and they tell you what to do. And they say, when you go back to your jobs, you are to, how do you implement this? This is them implementing what they learn. Uh, I'm thinking of Titus again. But anyway, you intend to add more to our sins and to, and to our trespass. For our trespass is great. And there is, uh, there is fifth wrath against Israel. He took it to he and said, God's going to get us. We're not right as it is. God's going to get us. So these men are standing up, and I say the soldiers, because the way it reads. Listen, so the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. Princes would be those who were in leadership positions. Okay? It, sometimes it speaks of royalty. Verse 15. And the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives and the spoil. What they do with the spoil? They clothed the people that were naked among them and they arrayed them and they shod them. I believe that means probably put the shoes on them and gave them to eat. They, these people probably hungry. You got slaves. You don't. When people did it the wrong way, wouldn't always feed them. They gave them to eat and to drink and anointed them. Now let's understand something here. They were related. It's really it's it's sad because we see Israel and Judah against each other and they were related. Well, you go back and look in Genesis, we saw that there was conflict between the brothers before they were ever given territories. We see it. 
Listen, they gave them to eat and to drink and anointed them. Some will say rubbed oil on them, probably sun's burning them and everything, and carried all the feeble of them up and uh, up upon asses. So the ones who were just some, I guess, were elderly or who got to a point where it, the 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 walk was too much, they put them on donkeys and and let them go back. Isn't that nice? Like, oh my God, what what if we obeyed the Lord like that? What if the world obeyed the Lord like that? They carried the feeble of them upon asses and brought them to Jericho. So they're going back, um, I would say southward. But if you're going back to Jerusalem, you'd say up because the Mount Zion. But anyway, in the city of palm trees to their brethren and they returned to Samaria. Now, I want to tell you something that I read. You might not think it too significant, but I'll tell you. 15 first, it says in these men, uh, which were expressed by name, I some commentaries believe that that's not the same men that we read in, in, in verse 12. When I was reading Josephus, I believe he said these four men that were named. So um, I, a lot of times you can you can see how Josephus really ties in with what the scripture says. I, I can't tell you which one, but I'm going to tell you before I read the commentary, I thought it was the same four men. What was the rationale that I read that why it wasn't the four men? Because they said, well, it would be too many. When you start looking at all of the captive people, it would be too many for four people. Well, I see sometimes when it comes to the military that you see my, you might see one man over 50 or one man over 100 or woman. So I don't, I, I don't know if that's a, a, a strong reason. So I tend to lean, and I'm not sure that it's the same four men. In the Josephus account, it said that those four men actually went back with him at least up to the point of Jericho. I like the way we see that these men were obedient. It looked like they had the fear of God in their hearts to see that God will act. God does have wrath. And we need to we need to um, get our lines uh, right accordingly. Now, let me see what time it is because there's a lot here. <sighs> there is still more things that's happening. Okay. So here I go again and I'm about to repeat something. Okay. Rezin and Pekah, they went up against Ahaz, king of Judah, not able to totally go through the walls of Judah. Ahaz, he asked for help from uh, tiglath pileser in Assyria. Now, I'm not exactly sure if it was at this point or after we see that the captives were taken. I think it was somewhere where they were having problems and he sees these captives being taken away. But the scripture in in 2 Chronicles 28, it tells us about at least two other nations that's going to come up against Judah. Oh my word. So listen listen to me now. We've mentioned two nations against Judah. We're about to hear about two other nations against Judah. When individuals persist in rejecting God's word, things happen. Things happen. It, yeah, and all that live godly shall suffer persecution. Well, the godly is going to suffer persecution. But listen at the wicked. Everything does not go right for the wicked. Sometimes it seems like it. But this Ahaz was supposed to be a man of God. Who are these other two nations? Uh, I would say the Philistines and the Edomites. So now you have the Syrians. You have Israel, the Philistines, and the Edomites going against Ahaz, I wonder if he said, what was me? Such bad luck befalls me. It ain't bad luck, dude. It is not bad luck. You knew what was right. What's the lesson for us? Obey God. Have a fear of the Lord when you get the get, get the get the the wisdom of God. Obey God. Don't let too much time pass. But the end of this chapter is not a nice. Well, it's nice because God recorded it. And it's nice because we see God keeps his word. But it's sad. Let's continue on. We're going to look here. Now, imagine while all. Imagine. Think while all this is going on. The consternation and the distress of Ahaz. I need some help. So whether it's at this point or after this point, the way it's written in, in 2 Chronicles 28 and 16, it looks like it's at this point. One thing I read said that that goes back to like you would put it right after verse five of this chapter. I'm going to read verse 5, and then I'm going to read verse 16 of chapter 28, okay? Not trying to confuse you. Listen at verse 5 of Second Chronicles 28. Wherefore the, law, wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him uh, and carried away a great multitude, and so forth. So you got Syria and Israel. Now, if we read verse 16 after it, 
At that time did King Ahaz send unto the king, kings of Assyria and basically asking for help. That's how it reads basically when you go back to Second Kings 16. But I'm like, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Isaiah's talked to somebody. Obed has talked to somebody. So somewhere in here, he's made a request. But we're about to learn what's going on with the Edomites and the Philistines. Make sense? Okay. Uh, please read, Dre. At that time, did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him? For again, the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh and Ajalon and Gedaroth and Shoko with the villages thereof and Timnah with the villages thereof, Gimzo also and the villages thereof, and they dwelt there. Read. For Yahweh brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against Yahweh. And Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed, and dis distressed him, but strengthened him not. So I want you to stop because that looks like it's a contradiction about with what we read in Second Kings. So there's, I'm trying to add a filler here. <laughs> I think I think a lot of tonight's uh, text is self-explanatory, but I think it's kind of like a puzzle when you have the jagged pieces. And I'm hoping, I'm, whether it's totally accurate chronologically or not, I'm hoping we have a fuller understanding, it seems, of what this these two texts seem to be telling us. Telling us. First, let me go back to, I want to go to verse 19. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. The Lord brought Judah low. He wanted to raise Judah up. He wanted to raise Israel up. He wants his people to be raised up in his government, in his wisdom. The other nations were totally supposed to be seeing, learning, and understanding, oh, my gosh, what kind of nation is this? What God? Such a great God. None of this seems to be happening right here. Well, the low country. Israel being the northern portion, Judah being the southern portion. If you just go a little further uh, south, um, because uh, Philistia, uh, okay, Philistia is to the to the to the west, and then you have those um, the the country. So coming a little bit inward into Palestine, southern Palestine, you'll see where some of these countries are. So it looks like basically Judah's being attacked from various angles, from the west, and you have the, where the, I think Syria has taken Eloth, which is uh, low, very south of Edom, and then you have uh, uh, Philistines and the uh, is it the Edomites? I just forgot because I'll start confusing the nations here. It, you, and yeah, Philistines. and you you have them coming. So serious from that. It's just like it's like encompassing Ahaz. Let me say something here. That's what happens with sin. Some some things will be pleasurable, but it's it's a limited sense, and it does bring it brings it brings about death. It's, <laughs> Listen at my title again. God will leave you to your own limited satisfaction. So while he drew satisfaction in seeking Tegelus the leads of the king of Assyria, so he, this man is dying. This man is being swallowed up. His nation is suffering. He has left the thing of the Lord. Now I asked Dree because I couldn't remember what was found. And she told me Proverbs 16 and 25. Dree, so before we go on and look at a little bit more of this, because I'm actually nearing the end of this text. I want you to read something for me because I think it fits well. So many scriptures do. Um, but this is the one that I, I want you to read. It's Proverbs 16 and 25. And we're going to go back to where we are here. There is a way that seems right unto a man. But the ends thereof are the ways of death. Now, you can be deceived by your own heart. You can be deceived by the philosophies of this world and are other people. OK, but unless we hold to the word of God, which is unchanging, it has his grace, it has his mercy, but it has his judgment. It will have his wrath. He will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. OK, so we need to understand this. So let's go back here. I want to look at we see these um, southern cities here being um, pillaged and so forth from these uh, 
enemy nations. And it says in the 19th verse again, the Lord brought Judah low because Ahaz, king of Israel, for he made Judah naked. Now, one version I was looking at, it's like naked. How, how do you mean that? It said it, it prom he promoted wickedness in Judah. But I think nakedness, I want to think about it in the sense of it would often bring bring shame to an individual or a nation. If you think about um, when we look in the uh, the book of Genesis and we see when Adam and Eve learned that they were naked, they were ashamed because they knew they had done wrong and sin had entered into the world. If you think about how when I was talking about the captives that were being brought before the city that had conquered them, they would be naked. It was a, it was a shameful it was shamefulness uh, to them that was to show them we have we have conquered you. You are now subservient to us. So when you see these various things, it's like you kind of think of that in the book of Ezekiel when you when you see the metaphor of how God says that he took that that child that was naked out there who was helpless and couldn't do any clothes. And, and then later on, the child grows up and forgets about God. We see we see we see pictures of this. Now, there are minor and major prophets that will speak of this time. We've talked about Amos. We've talked about Hosea. You could look in Micah, different different prophets who would talk about the time of this king and Jotham and so forth. When we read the scriptures, there's information and history if you need it. And it's good for us to understand. It's there. Hopefully I'm doing a, an okay job in bringing some of that to the table. Let's continue on with this, right? Here we go. So. I'm thinking that somewhere Tiglath Pileser has been contacted by some messengers with all of this. Why? Because Ahaz is still concerned about about Syria as well as as Israel. So uh, I want to turn back here just briefly to Second Kings. I reiterate: if you look at those first six verses. In 2 Kings 16 chapter, you see that he's having problems with Israel and Syria. And you see that's when he asks for help. Then you go down, you see where he does this with the altar. And he sends it and he sets that altar up. So what we're doing now again is we're looking at some other portions of scripture. Now, I mentioned something maybe six, seven minutes ago where it seems there's a second conflict in the scripture. right? If you look at, I'll see if I can remember. Uh, I want to look at verse 9 of 2 Kings 16. Okay. 2 Kings 16, chapter verse 9. You see where Tiglath Pileser, he comes and it says he hearkened to the voice of, of Ahaz and he goes and assists him. But when we, what drew, I think the last verse I had drew to read in 2 Chronicles 28 concerning the request by Ahaz of Tiglath Pileser. It says, listen at verse 20 again. I'm in second I'm in Second Chronicles 28 and 20. And Tiglath Pileser, the name is spelled differently, but it's referring to the same person. I'm also, I'm also say Tiglath Pileser, um, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. So it's like, okay, is the scripture contradicting itself? What happened? So, Let's see if <laughs> let's see if I can bring some information to this, and I'm going to read a a, a portion of Josephus, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I read first, okay? Because sometimes you you kind of get lost if if someone reads a lengthy text, and I do want to read a, a significant portion. So Tiglath Pileser comes over now. Tiglath Pileser in in Assyria that would be eastward. Uh, I think I've mentioned the last two weeks that that's more of a kind of from area of portion of Mesopotamia coming over. Syria, even though it sounds like Assyria, that's somewhat, that's basically northward of of Israel, the northern kingdom. So what I was reading, I think it's in Josephus. I think it was in Josephus. Tiglath Pileser comes over and he slays Rezin. Rezin is the king of Syria. So while he's up there, Ahaz goes up to Damascus. And it seems that that's because, you know, when, when a king would travel, sometimes they would travel in entourages. I didn't read that spe specifically, but it looks like he might have gotten a picture of a, of an altar there. I, I don't know. Uh, originally, I was thinking that he went to Assyria. So, again, I'm going to tell you, I don't know. But in, in reading, this is kind of 
uh, what I'm thinking. So anyway, so when uh, when uh, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, goes to Damascus, which is Syria, um, it looks like he helps to a certain extent Ahaz by killing Rezin. Does that make sense? But there is something that we need to remember before I read a little bit of the excerpt from Josephus. God said, don't make any leagues with other nations. Because a lot of times what will happen is they have, the nation is going to be thinking about itself. So you, we know that he's given the gold. We know that he's given the silver. He still passes the sun through the fight. Done all these wicked things. So why not with Tiglath Pileser make it seem like he's going to help Ahaz? So he goes over here and he relieves part of his problem by killing um, the king of Syria. But when we see in tonight's text in the 20th verse, he says he distressed Ahaz. Does that make sense? Okay, so I want to read just a little bit of um, Josephus and then we'll, we'll look at the, the, the last few verses of this particular chapter. Now, this is kind of lengthy, but I've, I've told you a little bit what it is. Now, listen, it starts as follows. This is coming from Josephus. Uh, Book 9 in the Antiquities of the Jews. This is book 9, chapter 12, last last portion. Okay, here I go. Hereupon, King Ahaz, having been so thoroughly beaten by the Israelites, sent to tiglath Pileser, king of the Assyrians, and sued for assistance from him in his war against the Israelites and the Syrians and Damascus, with a promise to send him much money. He sent him also great presents at the same time. Now this king, speaking of Tiglath Pileser, listen, if I got this right, listen. Now this king, Tiglath Pileser, upon a reception of those ambassadors, came to assist Ahaz and made war upon the Syrians and laid their country waste and took Damascus by force and slew Rezin their king and trans, listen at this, Tiglath Pileser transplanted the people of Damascus into the upper media and brought a colony of Assyrians and planted them in Damascus. In other words, Tiglath Pileser is like, you know what? I'm going to dispossess you of your own land and I'm bringing my people. That's the way you can't keep a certain continuity amongst yourself so you could raise up and fight. So when you read this again, Ahaz is probably like, yes, yes, kill that king, kill that king. He's, a, he's, he's been bothering me. Well, looks like he satisfies that. Listen at this. This is speaking of the Assyrian king. He also afflicted the land of Israel and took many captives out of it. While he was doing thus with the Syrians, King Ahaz took, listen, there's some chron chronology here. King Ahaz took all the gold uh, there was in the king's treasure and the silver. And what was in the temple of God, what precious gifts were there. And he carried with, with him and came to Damascus and gave it to the king of Assyria, according to his agreement. Okay, so he's paying the king off. You take out of God's house, who's bl blessing forever and has been your provider. Isaiah's come to you and talked to you, and you refuse to do it. And now you've got this foreign king coming there, and you depleting, taking the things out of God's house. Listen at this. So he confessed. This is Ahaz talking to Tiglath Pileser. I just got a little bit more. So he confessed that he owed him thanks for all that he had done for him and returned to Jerusalem. Listen. Now this king. Do I want to read this part just yet? I guess I'll go ahead and read it. Now this king was so sottish and thoughtless. I'm, I'm not going to read that yet. I'll come to it because it's, it's pertaining to the last verses. Now, so we see the Syrian king. Did kill resin, and we see it also in the scripture. Now, Drew, what I want you to do, don't you read verse 20 and read the last few verses. There's seven verses left of, of 2 Chronicles 28, and it's really, really egregious and abominable what Ahaz does. And Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. For Ahaz took away a portion of the house of Yahweh, and out of the house of the king, and of the princes, and gave to the king of Assyria, but he helped him not. What? But he what? And gave unto the king of Assyria, but he helped him not. Please read. And in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against Yahweh, this king Ahab? For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him, and he said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them, that they may help me. 
but they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of Yahweh. And he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. And in every several city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense unto other gods and provoked to anger Yahweh God of his fathers. Now the rest of the acts and all of his ways, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Ahaz slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city, even in Jerusalem. But they brought him not into the sepulchres of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. All right. Um, just to say something before I finish talking about these last few verses. <clears throat> On last week, look, I, know, I told you, hopefully in the beginning, that I'm going to be bouncing back and forth. Last week, um, in chapter 16 of 2 Kings, I did not read the last four verses. The last four verses of that is very similar to the last seven, six or seven verses here. The last four verses of Second Kings, the 16th chapter, seems to speak specifically of the altar that he used to replace the altar that God had in the temple. I'll just read a little bit of it. Listen at verse 17. Now, I don't intend to read them all, but you, you get the, you, the, the, the essence is the same. The action is similar. 2 Kings 16 and 17. And King Ahaz, this is talking about the altar, right? And King Ahaz cut off the borders of the bases and removed the lever from them and took down the sea from off the brazen oxen. This is dealing with the furniture that was in the temple. Remember when uh, Solomon was building it? I think it's, again, I'm, I'm thinking it's 2 Kings 5th, 6th, 7th chapter. Um, I think chapter eight is the big prayer. If it's not, it's it's in the in, in the area very meticulous. But listen, and King Ahaz cut off the borders of the bases and removed the lever from off them and took them. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. My wife corrected me when looking at the uh, the the building of the of the temple, the tabernacle, and so forth. That's in First Kings. Second Kings starts with. Uh, um, the kings from up north, that Hazael, I think, who fell out of the of the lattice and so forth. So thank you, Drew, for that correction. That's first kings. We're in second kings now. Anyway, basically, you see where Ahaz cut off part of the altar and so forth. And then he, he the 18th verse says, and the cover of the Sabbath that he had built in the house and the king's entry with, without, turned he from the house of the Lord. Now, you can read another version there. I just want you to see that even though I didn't cover that, it's 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 kind of like covered right here so let's go back to these last few verses second chronicles 28 we see that it's reiterated at the end of the 21st verse that tiglath pileser he didn't help um ahaz um he killed resin but it looks like he had something else going on he's strategically fighting this is warfare I can rule over many nations. I can rule over Syria. I can rule over Israel. I can rule over Judah. I'm going to move down into Egypt. I can do this because I'm big, I'm bad, and I got the military. You needed my help, and I got your gold, and I got your silver, and I'm taking some of the people from Israel captive. Do you see? I can do this. So what if you think that I'm coming to help you? The Bible says of Satan, Jesus says, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He said, well, Gary, that's not the best interpretation. That's not the best, what's the word I want to look at? Application. Why not? Who is it that is a deceiver? Who, who a deceiver from the beginning to help you feel like what you think and what other people say against God will work? Uh, now, here we are. The Bible says that, but he helped him not. 22nd verse. And in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that King Ahaz. What? You mean you found out that all these nations were against you, and now Assyria is against you, but you're going to turn 
to the gods of the Syrians because you feel like because they were victorious over you, you should turn to them. What kind of nonsense is this? It's absurd. Bible says that in Romans, because they knew they knew God, but glorified him not as God. I think that's how it says. And they rejected the knowledge of God. He let them have their way. And it ended up being to their ruin, their detriment, the death of them. Good Lord, even the people, the older generation that was coming up out of Egypt, what did God do? He, he smote the ones, was it above 20 years old? Come on now. But God is a loving God. Listen, I believe he still sends people and I believe that he still deals with people. We have names for these things now. We'll know in the judgment. Argue with me all you want to. Argue with me. God will leave you to your own limited satisfaction. I, what satisfaction did he get? He's turned into other gods now, and he has the truth right in his face. What a delusion. What a delusion. Let's go on to this 22nd verse. What else did Ahaz do in his distress? He won't turn to the Lord. Didn't listen to Isaiah. Won't look and see what's happening. He should have turned to the Lord. He should have repented. He should have been humble right here. 23rd verse. For Ahaz sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, that's the headquarters or capital of Syria, which smote him, which defeated him. And he said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them that they may help me. Because they're fickle and they'll change, but our God doesn't change. That's why I say, Hear, O Israel, our Lord, our God is one, one, one. Lord is one of him and all of Israel. Now, he goes on and he starts cutting up vessels in the house of God. Um, he shut the doors where the people can't go in and offer the sacrifices that God had ordained for them to do. He starts setting up uh, altars in the high places. These high places keep popping up. They keep, pun intended, they keep popping, popping, popping up. Not good. Now, I want to read one last thing here. And we're about to close this lesson out. Josephus said something that was interesting to me. Let's see if I can find it. This is the part that I chose not to read moments ago. Listen at this. And I hope, Drew, you will probably, you'll probably read it so much better than I, but I'm, I'm going to try it. This is still coming out of the Book of Antiquities, Book 9, Chapter 12. Now, this king was so sottish. I, was like, I like that word, sottish. I, mean, I wish I could read it like, this king was so sottish. Foolish, crazy, stupid, uh, whatever. I, I didn't look the word up, but I think context tells us. This is speaking about Ahaz after tiglath Pileser didn't help him, but distressed him. Listen, now this king Ahaz was so sottish and thoughtless of what was for his own good that he would not leave off worshiping the Syrian gods when he was beaten by them. But he went on in worshiping them, continued to worship them as though they would procure him victory. Listen at this part. This is the part I want to bring. And when he was beaten again, he began to honor the gods of the Assyrians. And he seemed more desirous to honor any god, any other gods than his own paternal and true God, whose anger was the cause of his defeat. And that it doesn't that seem to be the pattern of man. Well, I don't care what you say. I'm just not gonna listen. You can tell me. I I, I can say, okay, okay. That's why you see when the Bible looked like he he turned God he turned Pharaoh's heart. No, Pharaoh's heart was set to do that. I'll read the last few verses here, and then I said this was going to be the last thing, but in the sense of explaining more. Verse 25. In every several city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense unto other gods and provoke. Uh, to anger the Lord God of his fathers. Keep saying God of his fathers. Like he can't he can't speak possessively uh, of of Yahweh. Twenty six and twenty seven. Now the rest of the acts of and now the rest of the acts and of all his ways that is Ahaz first and last. Behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Ahaz slept. That means he's dead with his fathers and buried and, and they buried him in the city, even Jerusalem. But they brought him not to the sepulchre of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Well, uh, Ahaz, almost a Hezekiah, Ahaz had chances to get his life right, but he chose not to. A little bit of satisfaction, but I mean, he had trouble on every side. He was distressed. Um, 
uh, we don't have necessarily kings per se like what's in this text coming after us but if, if, if someone listens to this and, and, and you have issues going on either way whether it's issues that you you bring on yourself or issues that god is allowing someone to uh, how can i say cause to uh, provoke you unrighteously you need to turn to god but in the instance of what we see in this text tonight turn to god before it's too late don't be stubborn don't be stubborn that's for all of us let's not be stubborn but turn to god this man he just he could he, he rejected god and god left him to turn to his own limited satisfaction and he died a fool all right we're going to pray thank you god for giving us a chance to go through the scriptures tonight help us not to forget them but help us to understand that they're written for our learning so that we can understand we can through patience and comfort of the scripture we might we can have hope we have hope thank you for your grace and your mercy in teaching us how we should live i ask that you help us from day to day and in the evening when we close our eyes to slumber i ask these things in your son jesus name amen